Welcome everyone to the um, third um, roundtable of this roundtable series on Palestine, Israel, past, present and future. Uh, the roundtable of today is called um, Israel's Occupation of Palestine, War Crimes and Crimes Against Humanity. Um, and we are very, very fortunate to uh, be joined by, and I'm going to say the order in which uh, the speakers are going to speak, um, Rani Amadi, who is a senior advisor of law for Palestine and who is at the moment, as she just said, in Jordan, trying to get some people out of Gaza, very necessary work. Uh, we have Akil Takaz, who is the coordinator of the Palestinian Committee for Peace and Solidarity, who is joining us from Ramallah. And also Avihai Stoller, who is uh, known to most of us at Sayesh slash Filk because he is a colleague, a PhD student at the um, doctoral program in international relations, international politics and conflict resolution, who happens to be in uh, Madrid right now. Uh, I'm Teresa Almeida Cravo. I, I teach international relations at the Faculty of Economics, and I'm also a researcher at the Center for Social Studies. Um, I want to thank Moara, who's also here and who has um, been the main organizer of this roundtable series. Um, thank you for all your work as usual. This is the third, but I will say it now before um, people um, leave after the debate. The next roundtable is on the 11th of January, also at 2.30 um, GMT time. And it's the same link for all the roundtable series. And the table for um, the 11th of January is on the geopolitics of the conflict from World War II to normalization between Israel and Arab neighbors. Um, and uh, we will have, we have uh, three of the four speakers already confirmed, but we'll confirm the fourth one and put it on the website so you, so you can see. Thank you once more for all your efforts to actually be here right now, because I know it's quite hard to find the time to participate in these sort of events, and we're very appreciative of this. Um, so, Rania, I'll give the floor to you because you will be the first one. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Um, first of all, really, I thank you a lot to include me in this uh, respective, really, panel. And I hope that uh, the people who are joining us are very tolerant because uh, you might know that the English is my fifth language. You know, I live in Switzerland. We speak French and German and Italian. And I'm Arab as well. Uh, so I was really very proud with Moira, in which we didn't see each other since more than maybe five years. We used to meet in the UN, and I was very proud of what she was doing. So uh, I think after she heard that I was uh, really encouraged to go to the ICC uh, in December um, to invite me to join uh, this panel. So if I if I start from the end, you know, which uh, I don't want to start from the beginning, telling the story of the Palestinian people, etc., uh, because I can imagine that the speakers or the the people who join us. Uh, they know more or uh, less uh, because I should not start with the historical topics. But if you think this is very important, really, uh, uh, I'm able to do it. But in order not to lose time, especially I have just 10 minutes. Yeah, uh, I will start from the, the from the end, which is means why we went to the ICC. Uh, in fact, in 2016, uh, we took the, uh, the decision to address to the ICC. Uh, why? Uh, because now everybody's speaking about uh, the issue of Gaza and uh, the Israeli uh, committed crimes, and uh, everybody know that South Africa addressed to the ICJ, etc. In fact, uh, my answers to all these people, it's like just to remind them about it's not the first time the Israeli attack the population in Gaza. If you want to speak about Gaza. So just to remind you, in 2008, uh, December, then 2012, 14, uh, 18, 21. So just to remind you how many uh, special sessions in the UN uh, during the Human Rights Council, how many resolutions, and uh, really we are happy that the last uh, uh, resolution, the creation of the ongoing investigation committee created by the United Nations in 2021, 
in which the, the president uh, is Madame Pelé. Madame Pelé used to be the high commissioner during four, four years. She's originally from South Africa and she used to be a judge. So in, in fact, I felt very happy when, uh, when this committee was created because we worked really hard before that. So my question to people who really try in one way or another just to undermine the issue of the ICC, it's like the Israeli used to commit crimes and crimes against humanity. It's not just now the first time. So, uh, uh, and in fact, my answer to others who say the war is between Hamas and Gaza, I told them this is also false because uh, uh, why 273 have been killed in the OPT and they are not Hamas? Some of them are Christians, some of them are children, some of them workers, etc. So in fact, the, 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 the decision to go to the ICC, it doesn't just include the issue of the war now uh, since three, war, three months, the Israeli attacks against the population in Gaza, uh, according to what's happened in the 7th of October. If I want to go to the ICC, which is mean, I include both parts, which is mean uh, Hamas, as uh, they, they call it, and the, of course, the Israeli uh, army. So um, after this, after what's happened, you know, in, uh, in the ICC, and hopefully it was accepted, but because we, I don't want to say we don't trust the ICC. The ICC is politicized and Israel is not a part, uh, the USA as well is not a part. So I went to South Africa, uh, I was invited by the, the, the what we call the young uh, son of uh, Mandela, the grandson of Mandela, Manda Mandela, and in fact, it was a decision to discuss with some high lawyers, is it important to join us in the ICC or what? Honestly speaking, as a UN person, uh, I said it's better for a country to go to the ICG than the ICC. Uh, first of all, we didn't imagine that Karim Khan, the, I mean, uh, from the ICC, he will go to the right direction because of the American pressure. Uh, because, in fact, this is the way how he was really appointed as, uh, you know, uh, for the court. Uh, the ICJ, which is more international, and it's linked to the UN, and it's created in 1948. In 2016, we decided uh, many organizations, after uh, the Palestinian Authority, we pushed them to sign the Rome status to go to the ICC. So we went to the ICC in 2016, and the issue was uh, just to prove that all these wars against the Gaza, it's the force displaced the Palestinians. And this project is not new. It was really, if we want to go back uh, until the 1948, when uh, really the, the Israeli occupied a part of, the, of Palestine, and after the resolution 181, the creation of Arab state and the Jewish state. But unfortunately, it wasn't enough for them. So they then we had the war in 1967, in which the whole Palestine was under occupation. And then just to, to, to arrive to the now, to the time now, to the, to the time being, um, in fact, uh, there was the Oslo agreement in which really the recognition of let's say a Palestinian state. I'm personally, I was not really in favor of this issue because to create a state under occupation, you know, it's different than when a state became occupied. Um, uh, I mean, there is a, there is a, a differences between uh, the, the, the state which was created, which is called Palestinian state, and even they didn't call it a state, they call it Palestinian Authority. And for the Palestinian people, we consider this Palestinian Authority, it's like most, mostly we consider that they are doing the work of the Israelis. This is bad for me as a Palestinian to say that, because unfortunately, this Palestinian Authority are unable to intervene when the Israeli army uh, enter any village or city or uh, demolish a house or uh, really arrest a kid or anything. So this is why they don't have any authority. So they call it Palestinian authority. And this is what we dare to tell in the European Union. 
that now you want to fight Hamas or you are happy that Israel want to uproot, uproot Hamas from, from Palestine, but in fact, now you push all the people to support Hamas as a, as a, a movement of uh, resistance. And because the occupying power, and we all know uh, the occupying power, when they attack a country or a state or population, they are not the one who we can call them, they are defending themselves because they are really occupied a territory. So the people under occupation have the right to use all methods in order to end the occupation. So this is why I said when, when, the, when the State of Israel was created in 1948 under the resolution 181, uh, in which the United Nation itself, uh, after 30 years in 1977, they recognized that something wrong happened. This is why they create the International Day of Solidarity with the Palestinian people, the 29th of November, which is really exactly uh, 75 year, uh, 30 years after the creation of the State of Israel. Uh, now we come to this court. In, in fact, it comes really exactly after the 75 years of the uh, convention, the, uh, the prevention of the genocide convention. So this is why we, I encourage the, the South African to go now and not to wait until the next year. I mean, in fact, it's it's became like symbolic, uh, let's say some weeks after uh, where uh, all the, the, I mean, the international community is trying to avoid, and we had in the United Nations in Geneva, a very big event in order to explain the reason why this convention uh, was signed. And by the way, just to remind that Israel is a part of this convention. So this is why the, the, the South African were very smart and it was very important for them to fill the charges that Israel is guilty of genocide action in Gaza. So the Israeli decided by the way to appear before the ICJ to challenge the South African lawsuit accusing this Jewish state in which uh, we know before we call it Israeli state, but after the, the Knesset, which is the Israeli parliament, really decided to call it a Jewish state. And this has pushed me to speak a little bit about the Palestinians, the, the million and a half, million and 800 Palestinians who live in this, in this state of Israel. What they, these people will become after the creation of a Jewish state and they are not Jewish. They are the indigenous, they are the minority of the state. So just now, before I open the Zoom, I received email from one Palestinian organization uh, registered under the Israeli law that they, the Israeli, they, uh, they accused one director of one organization because they speak about uh, this genocide that they should, uh, the Israeli, they, they will kick him out and took his nationality. So he will become this person like, stateless and we know the issue of which is very important in the international community the palestinian issue of the refugees because we know the only refugee in the world who are not protected under the 1951 convention of refugees why because the creation of the honor in 1948 it was just a humanitarian to help these refugees who were obliged to leave in 1948 to jordan to Syria, to Lebanon, and a, a little part, and to Jordan, of course. But uh, the, the Palestinians who went to Iraq with the Iraqi army, they are not really under this category of uh, Palestinians. So now we are really facing this, uh, um, let's say this challenge uh, about the ICJ uh, in the future, I mean, it will be the 11th of um, January. I will be there, of course, uh, because it was an idea of uh, many lawyers or uh, many, uh, let's say, international lawyers who used to work for this issue in order to uh, really to help them. So the complaint, in fact, address, uh, addresses the crimes which are directly linked to the Israeli military op um, uh, operations uh, not just uh, in Gaza, but also in the Palestinian, uh, in the Palestinian uh, territory. So the South African, they asked the ICJ, in fact, for an urgent order declaring that the Israeli was 
in uh, breach of its obligations under 1948 genocide convention, which was, as I said, the 4th December. So the Israeli army was violating its obligations under this treaty. So now we are facing two issues. First of all, the displacement of the Palestinian for the, I don't know how many times, uh, from Gaza. Now you can imagine a million and a half who lost their houses or the whole area where they used to live. And if they were obliged to leave or they forced to leave to the, let's say to Egypt, to Jordan, we are sure that they will never be able to return again because we have the example of what's happened of the Palestinians who were obliged to leave uh, Palestine either in 1948 or after 67. And this is why they became like either useless or forced displaced or refugees and they don't hold any document uh, which really uh, prove their nationality. I saw your hand was raised, so I will stop for the moment waiting for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Vanya. Um, this is a great start for a very, very complex issue. Thank you so much, Vanya. Um, this is a great start for a very, very complex issue. Um, I will give the floor to Nahed Samur, please. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, um, uh, yeah, I'd love to take the chance to speak about atrocity crimes. So not only war crimes and crimes against humanity, but obviously also genocide. So the kind of three, the holy uh, three within international law, if you want. And so uh, as someone who uh, is part of a critical circle of international lawyers, I think it's important to start with whether the law and international law in particular can be part of the problem or, or also part of the solution, right? So we know that historically and up until the present, international law was set up to privilege nations, nation states, at the expense of non-state actors. And we know that it privileges those with sovereignty uh, over those that are still struggling to see their collective self-determination fulfilled. And we know that the international legal community has authorized, for instance, the UN Partition Plan, i.e. taking away territory from an indigenous community to give it to another community against the very will of the indigenous. And we uh, and that has failed very much to, recog and, uh, to recognize the illegality of the UN partition plan in 1947. Um, also international law has allowed the normative regime of occupation, which per se is lawful in international law and is regulated in the Geneva Convention and the Hague regulations. Um, but applying occupation as a legal concept has covered up Israel's continued presence that makes this occupation illegal, which probably the ICJ will be uh, deciding on in uh, this coming this year with the hearing starting in February. Um, and with this, uh, probably the uh, occupation's temporary nature that has then transformed into permanent one might be declared illegal by the International Court of Justice. Um, we also know that the International Court of Justice has already in the past, in its advisory opinion, declared the Israeli wall or fence over the Palestinian lands to be illegal in 2004. Uh, and yet the international law did not prevent uh, us from getting, from seeing the situation getting so much worse now in Palestine, um, even when the International Criminal Court's uh, decision 2021 to start with the preliminary investigations over the Israeli attacks against Gaza in 2014 did also not prevent the atrocities we're witnessing today. So this is a question why we're talking about international law in the first place, or if so, how should we talk about international law when we're discussing Palestine and Israel? Now, I think um, the first point I would like to make is that we should uh, take an instrumental approach to international law. This means that we do not need to come up with a final assessment of whether law is the problem or the solution for a certain question. And it's not whether about whether we're gonna lose or win the case, let's say the genocide case now before the International Criminal, uh, the International Court, but rather what opens up, what does a case open up to discuss the actual problems and structures at hand? Does a case pending before court allow us to use that case as a kind of educational, as an instructive means to tell, um, to inform, um, and to see how to overcome the very uh, problem we're seeing there. Um, and so when you submit a case of genocide to international or to domestic courts, as is presently the case, uh, what does the law in between 
uh, the time of submitting a case until the very decision and possibly even after the court decision, what does the law allow us to do in that pending time and afterwards? And I think these could be kind of the important questions, because even if you take the case of the Armenian genocide, we know it, ca it can take up to 100 years for international community to recognize a, a genocide, right? So we have absolutely no idea, even though obviously there are already public hearing schedules uh, scheduled for next week, to decide on the provisional um, measures that need to be taken, right? But the very question, and maybe, maybe, and I think you're gonna, uh, I, I'm, I'm soon gonna start talking about, you know, basically international law being too important to leave it in the hands of nation states and courts alone, right? So there are other actors here that need to be, and are already very much involved in pushing forward with international law. Um, so yes, uh, uh, question is not only how is it well, how is it, it's employed by institutions, international, and national courts, but also how is it international law employed by social movements, national and transnational ones. And I think uh, social movements will come back to this in, in just a few moments. I think will prove here very crucial. Um, I do wanna. Uh, so we all, um, many of us, uh, I think, got a bit surprised by South Africa's uh, move. Uh, last year, last week, to go before the International Court of Justice. That's because we know the International Court of Justice will start its hearings on the question of the illegality of the occupation in February. So there was a strategic question whether people should wait until these hearings are over um, or, you know, already go to the International Court of Justice. And as Rania just said, there are also pending court, um, cases uh, before the International Criminal Court. And I'm sure most of you know that the International Court of Justice uh, tries nation states uh, versus the International Criminal Court that tries individuals. Now, I want to start uh, before December, uh, late December, when South Africa, the Republic of South, South Africa, decided to push forward with a genocide case. I want to start with November 9th, which is when three leading Palestinian human rights organizations, Al Haq, Mizan, and the Palestinian Center for Human Rights, uh, called on the ICC, the International Criminal Court, to issue arrest warrants against Israeli leaders for genocide and incitement to genocide. Um, and this action followed other submissions uh, these three uh, Palestinian human rights organizations made over the years. Uh, and they, in, in that very kind of submission, they included the open letters submitted by 101 associations and academics to the ICC Office of the Prosecutor um, um, to basically build a kind of global legal initiative to hold the state of Israel and Israeli officials accountable for their actions. So in that very kind of uh, submission by human rights organizations to the ICC, you already see how basically um, um, human rights organizations together with social movements and academics uh, came together to do this kind of meaningful work uh, in this submission to the court. And in that they uh, claimed... Um, Basically, they con they they connected um, questions of the genocide to war crimes and crimes against humanity, um, and so they basically brought the three kind of crimes of international law together to the court. Uh, it's two weeks later, or like, no, sorry, it's a roughly a week later, November sixteenth, when we saw the UN special experts call on international community to prevent genocide against the Palestinian people. And that's exactly when they uh, pointed out, out the a genocide in the making. So basically, I just want to uh, guide you through in a, just a few minutes, basically, how we have human rights organizations going to courts, how we're having UN special uh, rapporteurs. And it's important to point, point out this um, group of people in particular, because while they uh, UN special rapporteurs, they're not representing nation states, right? They're independent, basically independent rapporteurs in, in a variety of different fields. And first there were nine uh, when they came up together, or I think eight or nine in the first time. And then later on, they came together at 22 special rapporteurs to point out that there is a genocide in the making, um, and that, uh, again, they're connecting not only the question of the Nakba to the occupation, but uh, to the, the genocide as such. So you see here that at an early stage in November, uh, again, another institution raising the red flag of genocide. 
And that's kind of important why uh, they're already raising the red flag because the UN Genocide Convention has two elements. It has the preventing genocide part and the punishing genocide part. And when these institutions started, they all started out, uh, out with preventing genocide to basically widen strategically to have a kind of a leeway, some kind of window of, of, a window of opportunity to allow all these states to... Um, to commit to their state obligations to uh, basically do whatever is possible to prevent the genocide uh, before then the next move would be to then um, uh, punish the genocide. Um, a bit later in November 17th, we have the International Commission of Jurists, again, stressing the duty of states to prevent the genocide. So again, an international commission, an international um, institution, not representing nation states actually, but legal scholars, that are very um, that are obviously um, stressing not only the kind of specific activities here that are taking uh, place, but are already also kind of documenting the specific intent that is needed for genocide, and which has made it so far so difficult to bring not only genocide uh, to the court, but also to see it tried and to see the very phrasing of genocide applied here. And you you see again another um, institution that very much then goes back to Gambia versus Myanmar to show um, that the ICJ, for instance, is already kind of involved um, in, uh, uh, in trying um, genocide. Um, I also wanna um, I also wanna uh, refer to cases of genocide before domestic courts because obviously with universal jurisdiction the question is not only how uh, how do people move uh, or how do institutions or nation states move uh, to bring genocides to international courts but with, for instance, um, uh, in November 13th we saw the Center for Constitutional Rights moving. Uh, together with Palestinian human rights, to file a lawsuit in U.S. federal courts against President Biden, Secretary of State Blinken, and Secretary of Defense Austin for their failure to prevent and their complicity in the unfolding genocide. Uh, also, I want to mention the al haq and the U.K.-based Global Legal Action Network, LAN, uh, going before a U.K., Court to also ask for judicial review of the UK government's export licenses for the sale of British weapons um, that are uh, capable of being used in Israel's um, military uh, and, and genocidal actions in Gaza. We're now with um, the genocide case before the ICJ, and because I have only a few minutes left, um, I basically wanted to show you that, you know, um, while, and I think it's very historic here that is South Africa in particular going to the International Court of um, Justice. Um, but I think, um, uh, but what I think here, sorry, I, okay, sorry. Um, so basically, I'm, I, because I come from a very criti critical tradition of international law, the, the question is always, you know, what is it that courts and nation states are really willing and capable of doing in questions? Uh, of genocide or war crimes or crimes against uh, humanity. And I think what's important here uh, is that we've been seeing in the last weeks that it's actually social movements when, especially when they go to the streets and when they protest, whether it's on campus or uh, or anywhere else, whether it's uh, the uh, unionists, whether it's especially at the, the harbors where probably arms are being kind of transferred from one the train train racks to the uh, ships. Uh, it's basically these kind of crucial points where international law has been taken uh, on, and where you could see lots of placards and posters saying "Stop genocide." So you see social movements pretty much taking over the vocabulary of um, social movements. Uh, sorry, taking over the vocabulary of international law. And I think it's important to point this out because, as we know historically, apartheid in South Africa was not overcome through a court decision, right? So it's so as much as I want, uh, because that's what we do, lawyers, right? Of course, we do go to the courts, but I, I think it's important to be here, kind of critically, kind of uh, yeah, evaluate basically the past. And we know, for instance, apartheid has not been overcome by a court decision, but rather really by social protests all over the world. And with this, I think it's important that international law kind of finds its way to the streets and to the movements and to the unions and basically, uh, where, you know, uh, because it's obviously too important to leave it in the hands of nation states only. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nahed. Um, I will um, give the floor to Takel now, please. 
Thank you very much. First, I would like to thank you for giving me uh, this opportunity to address to you and to your audience, uh, taking in consideration that I am not expert in international laws and uh, procedures and so on. So uh, I I will I will talk about that, but I I will start with a historical brief about the Palestinian issue relating to the uh, international laws and decisions. As you know, uh, Palestinian Palestinian uh, issue is not uh, it didn't start in seventh of October as uh, many of the Western me media and uh, especially Israel and uh, United States trying to say that uh, the whole problem started in seventh of October because seventh of October was a result of uh, a long story of uh, our history of Israeli behavior from. Uh, 1947, uh, 48, and and then even before that, uh, from uh, uh, Belfort Declaration, uh, uh, 1917, when uh, Belfort decided to uh, help in establishment a Jewish state in Palestine and helping uh, settlers to come from all over the world to Palestine, and then this this Israeli uh, organizations or Jewish organizations started <clears throat> their violence against Palestinians. St uh, the first the first decision of United Nations about Palestine, which was violated from the first moment, is one eight one for the partition of Palestine. Israel as uh, uh, one side of this uh, partition was established in 1948, but Palestine until now, Palestinian state until now, uh, didn't establish. And, and as you know, from the first moment Israel occupied uh, a big part of the Palestinian state, where the Palestinian uh, state has to be established, Israel uh, already occupied uh, around 50% of the territory where the Palestinian has to be established from 1948. And then, as uh, you remember, 56 Israel with Britain and French uh, occupied Gaza, uh, reaching the Suez Canal uh, against Egypt. Uh, Rania said Israel occupied the whole Palestine and from 67 until now, all Palestinian territories under occupation, even Gaza, uh, with uh, we, with Israel to uh, say that they withdrew from Gaza, but they seized Gaza and they controlled Gaza from sea uh, and from the borders. It means that <clears throat> from '67, the whole territory of Palestine is under occupation. In uh, 1973, there was a. a, a uh, again, war between Israel and Arab countries. Uh, 82, you remember that Israel invaded Lebanon and saved Beirut for more than 50 days and uh, forced the Palestinian organization to leave Beirut and to, to be uh, refugees in some countries, in Tunisia, Yemen, Algeria, and some other countries. Uh, the Palestinian first uh, uprising, 87, started with the... Uh, a huge uh, 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 participation of the Palestinian people in, in West Bank and Gaza, uh, forcing Israel and Western countries to, to start negotiations about the future of Palestine. And uh, as uh, also mentioned, uh, there was an Oslo Agreement 93. Oslo Agreement had to be uh, uh, ended Ninety-nine with the establishment of Palestinian state, but now there is more than thirty years without establishment of Palestinian state. In contrary, now uh, with the, with the latest developments, nobody can say that Palestinian state is near to be established with Israeli uh, army, Israeli occupation to start uh, this genocide against Palestinians in Gaza, but not only in Gaza, as you uh, said and as you remember, before the 7th of October, Israel was committing uh, uh, invasions and in West Bank. In West Bank, there was more than two, 200 Palestinians to be killed in West Bank with, by settlers, in, uh, armed settlers and Israeli army before 7th, and after 7th, 
there is more than 300 Palestinians in West Bank to be killed and more than 4,000 4, Palestinians to be arrested in West Bank and invasions in Jenin, in Tulkarim, in uh, Nablus uh, and other places in West Bank uh, are uh, every day and night target of Israeli invasions and attacks and killings. Yesterday, before yesterday, there was five killed in, in Azun, in Kalkilia. They, they, they uh, killed uh, people by drones in, in uh, Tul Karim, in the Nur Shams, and uh, in Balata. And the, the, this behavior is continuing for 75 years of Israeli establishment. This means that what, what, what is going on in Palestine is a result of Israeli occupation and Israeli behavior and Israeli aggression 75 years of its, its, its establishment and prevention the Palestinian uh, preventing the Palestinian uh, people to have self-determination and establish uh, their their own state. But if we ask how can Israel do all this without any any measures against Israeli occupation and Israeli government, we know that there was a lot of uh, international uh, laws and decisions from uh, from uh, the Security Council, the General Assembly, and other organizations of international uh, organizations about Palestine, but no one was implemented because Israel, backed by United States, who is uh, covering Israel di politically, diplomatically, economically, and with weapons, and we can say now that this genocide which is taking place in Palestine is uh, with, with the full participation of United States. As you are following three months until now, is uh, United States is preventing uh, the Security Council to issue a decision for ceasefire, which means that uh, United States is a full part of this aggression against Palestinian people and this genocide committing by Israeli army with U.S. weapons. And from the first day we saw uh, Macron and uh, Sonak and uh, Schulz to, to run to come to Israel to express their, their support to the Israeli aggression and to, the, to Israeli occupation. We believe now that because of some uh, pressure of uh, the, the uh, people in the streets in, in Western uh, countries, they started to change some uh, uh, positions, but uh, in, 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 uh, in fact, they are supporting the aggression of Israel. Israel is not uh, uh, fighting or uh, uh, aiming to, to fight against Hamas. Israel is aiming to kill the Palestinians as much as Palestinian people to be killed and to force the other who are not killed to go out of Palestine. Israel and the Zionist uh, movement uh, aiming to have Palestine, Palestine without Palestinians. And as you remember from the November the last year when uh, Netanyahu won the elections and created then his government with uh, some fascist elements as Bing Beer and, and Smotrich, Smotrich said clearly that the Palestinians in Palestine has three choices, or to accept the occupation, or to go out of Palestine, or to be killed. And they are they, they choose the third one. They are trying to kill as much as uh, Palestinians. And because of that, Israel, Israel is aiming to force Palestinians to leave. We, and if Israel is, succeed to do that in Gaza, they will come to West Bank to do the same, to push Palestinians to go to, to Jordan. What I want to say also, uh, relate, related to the uh, laws and international decisions and the courts, and I think that Palestinians during the 75 years of, of, uh, of uh, establishment of Israel lost their uh, trust that any international any international uh, uh, organization can do something to their cause because 75 years uh, Palestinians had a lot of decisions from the United Nations from the Security Council and nothing was implemented because of the position of United States and Western countries 
Unfortunately, in the latest three, three months, Palestinians saw that all international organizations are unable to do nothing to help to help Palestinians. They are not able even to, to, to get some food or water to the Palestinians in Gaza. And if you ask now any Palestinian about the international court or the uh, ICC and, and, and any, any organization, they will say they will do nothing for Palestinians because they are they, they, they prove that they are controlled by United States and Western countries who are not willing to do anything for the Palestinian issue. They are watching, they are supporting Israel to kill uh, as much as Palestinians and if they succeed. And if you remember from the beginning of this latest uh, conflict in Gaza and genocide from Israel, Blinken came four or five times uh, and he was... Uh, putting pressure on Egypt to accept open borders for Palestinians to go uh, to Sinai. Now Israel is aiming to uh, to control uh, uh, Philadelphia, which, which is the, the, the small passage between Egypt and, and Gaza, to open it for Palestinians to go out. Israel is not stopping uh, dealing with this uh, target to uh, expel Palestinians out of Palestine and unfortunately international uh, community is not doing enough. I, 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 I will say they are not able, but I, they are not doing enough. We believe that uh, with the millions of people who are uh, supporting Palestinians in all uh, cities in the West and in the East, uh, we'll, we'll make some change, but with the official positions of, of uh, countries, starting from United States to, uh, uh, to the Arab countries who are here seeing that Palestinians are uh, to be killed every day and not doing anything and Israel to uh, to do uh, massacres and to kill people and uh, the latest uh, uh, attack in, in, in Lebanon is uh, also, also uh, a try from Israel to uh, to have a wider war, because we, we know that Netanyahu has uh, his own problems inside Israel, and he is afraid from uh, the court after, but not he is afraid from uh, international community or from the Security Council of, or the laws outside. And because of that, we believe that, that continuing the solidarity with Palestinian people to have the to, to have all, all these possibilities, even uh, without big hope that in the courts some, something will, will happen, it is very important to, to continue with that. That uh, without having a just solution of Palestinian problem, without giving the Palestinian people their right to uh, establish their, their states uh, with borders of 67 with East Jerusalem as its capital and the uh, right of refugees to uh, return, there will be no peace in the Middle East. And unfortunately, the history will uh, write that uh, all, all international organizations were not able to do anything for Palestinians during 75 years of this conflict. We hope that with the uh, solidarity of all democratic and peace-loving people all over the world will uh, put pressure on their governments to change their position and to, to support some uh, solution for the Palestinians to stop this genocide and to give the Palestinians the opportunity to live as all the peoples of the, the, the world in peace and to, uh, to look forward for their, uh, for their future, to create their future as every people in, in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Akel. Um, I can say for certainty that we all share those um, wishes here. I'll um, give the floor to uh, our last but not least speaker, um, Abi Haistala, please. Um, all right, thank you very much. I want to start with a small introduction and say that uh, I'm not sitting here as, I guess, uh, as a PhD student of SESH, but I guess that uh, what I wanted to share with you today comes from my experiences uh, human rights researcher and an arms specialist in the last, in the last more or less six or seven years, I've been involved in a project 
uh, that is attempting to understand, I guess, the method, the modus operandi of the Israeli army in its operations in Gaza from 2009 uh, and until today. I mean, we are, I guess, our main source of information for this project has been the soldiers themselves. We interviewed a couple of hundred soldiers and officers that participated in the Israeli army. And I guess what uh, was initially, I guess, the motivation to do this project, to try and understand how the IDF works before, of course, how it uh, resonates on everything that has been uh, said already today in regards to, uh, to the law is something much more basic. It's to try and understand why from 2009 and on, uh, every time the Israeli army went inside Gaza or attacked Gaza, the outcomes were so deadly and disastrous. So I don't have a lot of time, so I will try to actually present uh, our findings, um, I guess, the, the main findings, the main three pillars, I guess, of uh, IDF activity and how it reflects on, on, on what we're seeing today. I just have to say that we didn't, I didn't collect testimonies from soldiers, not yet at least, that participated in the war that is still waging, but I think that what I'm about to present uh, uh, or from what I'm seeing until now is definitely still relevant and can explain a lot of the things that we're seeing now. So the first thing that, that is important to speak about is in a sense an ethical guideline of the Israeli army that has been developing since the Lebanon war, but definitely has been very dominant in the way that the IDF fight. It is the, basically the guideline that the lives of Israeli soldiers come before the lives of uh, Palestinian civilians. This is not just speculative. This is something that has been mentioned and uh, articulated by IDF philosophers like Asa Kasher. Uh, but aside from being some kind of, I guess, uh, ethical umbrella, when we spoke to the soldiers themselves, this, uh, I guess, guideline has very practical uh, manifestations in the way that the IDF fights. And the first thing, for example, that comes to mind when we ask the soldiers about the rules of engagement when they went when they go into Gaza, when they are allowed to shoot, then basically one soldier after another told us that there are no rules of engagement. That basically they were told that they're going to war, and therefore every time they feel threatened, they they need to to fire without uh, having any hesitation. That they need to forget anything that they remember from I don't know policing missions in the West Bank. Uh, but it doesn't stop with the rules of engagement. Basically, the IDF, to a large extent, converted the area, yeah, converted Palestinian towns and neighborhoods where the IDF ground forces are going into, uh, into basically war zones. They, will, they are fighting there the same way they would fight, I don't know, in the desert if they would be, I don't know, fighting the Egyptian army, which means that, first of all, they bombard the area with cannons to soften the targets, as the military lingo says, and then there is constantly a wall of fire in front of the, of the soldiers that is there in order to protect and safeguard uh, those soldiers. Every house that you might see, I don't know, a silhouette in the window, you fire a tank shell, everything that you see you fire uh, you fire at and um, and you're not supposed and, and again the, the starting point is that they are not supposed at least in the minds of the soldiers to be civilians there and every person every individual that you see there is a threat and you and it's a, an open fire policy now the second thing that uh, is I guess even deeper is something that maybe some of you heard is something that is called the, the Adachia Doctrine, which is named after uh, the quarter in Beirut. This uh, doctrine uh, was introduced in the Second Le Lebanon War. And it was basically the IDF's way, the, the Israeli military apparatus way to answer a problem that was already existed before that when you're fighting in a non-symmetrical warfare against, uh, against a non-state organization, then you cannot win, you cannot achieve victory in the same way. As one general uh, said, said, you cannot chase every rocket launcher. It's literally impossible. So you need to find the victory in another way. So the solution that they fight is what they call disproportional strike, meaning that in order to create a situation in which you achieve deterrence and deterrence becomes the, uh, to a large extent, the, the, the desired outcome, then you want to to uh, to strike in such a, a fierceness, such a, such a, a, a power that your enemy will never be able to anticipate uh, 
uh, what you're about to do. This is true towards Hamas, but it is also true indirectly. Yeah, if you basically destroy and leave scorched earth in Gaza, you're also to some extent uh, deterring Hezbollah in the north. But this is also not just some kind of, you know, very uh, broad uh, theoretical, uh, uh, I guess, uh, doctrine. It also has very practical uh, implementations. For example, when we spoke to the soldiers, they said that how they witnessed the D9 bulldozers demolishing one house after another. After, for example, how after they uh, pulled out from the neighborhoods that uh, they took over during previous operations, uh, you know, the, the F-15 flew in and uh, leveled one house after another for no operational reason, but to basically uh, uh, leave uh, completely leveled uh, neighborhoods behind them. And it's also about the targets that you strike in the first place. The whole notion of, uh, you could say, psychological warfare targets plays a big part in this uh in this doctrine. For example, that any house, any building that belongs to a Hamas official was leveled already in previous operations from the idea that when, and again, I'm quoting here, that when Hamas officials will come out of the tunnels, they would realize that they have no more homes. And it doesn't end with this. It's also the civilian infra infrastructures themselves. For example, if there was a painful blow uh, against Israeli targets during the operations, then you retaliate by starting to uh, take down every building that has more than 10 floors or five floors. Yeah, and now I have to say that at least in previous operations, the Adachia doctrine spoke about civilian infrastructures. Yeah, it wasn't about the civilians themselves. What's, what's going on in this operation is more difficult for me to say and, and conclude from what we're seeing there, uh, a, from what we're seeing there uh, now, but again, fundamentally, a lot of the destruction and this intentional disproportionality is completely calculated and 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 decided ahead of the operation. Now, the last and the third point I want to touch on is the emphasis on the use of remote fire, and by remote fire, I mean the use of drones and F-16 uh, uh, dropped munitions and loitering munition, basically. Fire that was that was sent by itself, yeah, without the soldiers. This is important before anything else because I would actually assume, or more than assume at this point, that most of the civilians that were killed and are being killed as we speak now in this war and in previous incursions into Gaza were not the result of Israeli infantrymen shooting them. Most of them were basically buried under their houses when 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 F-16 uh, uh, a fighter jets dropped one ton bombs on their houses. Now, the issue about that starts from the fact that even if you somehow accept, for example, as many Israelis do, the, the what I started with, this notion of, uh, of, of the, the safety of our soldiers come first, here we are, to a large extent, talking about strikes that didn't even happen where the Israeli for forces were maneuvering. We're talking, if we're talking about uh, previous operations, we're talking about west to Salah Adin. If we're talking about this war, we're talking about Rafa, and we're talking about Dir el Balah, and we're talking about uh, the Muasi, all those areas where there are no soldiers to protect. Now, at the same time, these areas are inhabited by civilians because unlike the neighborhoods uh, where the IDF is maneuvering that there are still civilians, but much less because the IDF pushed them out, basically. Here, not only that there are civilians, there are even more civilians than normal because that's where all the refugees went to. And these areas, to some extent, are being bombarded repeatedly and nonstop. Now, the thing about this is that, at least in the Israel, when we're talking about, I guess, what Israelis often repeat, definitely Israeli uh, uh, officials is that we they take pride in this type of strikes. They're saying that they're very precise, that they are that they rely on a very accurate intelligence, and that that these are precision strikes. You know, throwing a rocket through a window and only uh, uh, killing uh, the Hamas militant that uh, they were targeted uh, targeting. When we spoke to the soldiers, if it's the intelligence men or the guys in the operational rooms or the guys who were operating the UAVs. The, in reality, the, the story is completely different, which of course uh, helps understanding why so many civilians died due to, the, to those strikes. Because for example, when we started with what they were targeting, like uh, what were the targets, then a lot of the targets, uh, like I said, were not 
what you could call in, uh, I guess, to go back to the legal aspect, uh, justified military targets. Yeah, like I mentioned before, the psychological warfare uh, targets, aside from that, um, as one, one Israeli general said uh, in this war, basically any building that has a Hamas mailbox uh, was uh, bombed and leveled, yeah? And when we asked them, how did you even know that these war targets were accurate? Yeah, when we're talking about the 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 accurate intelligence that they that they had, then in reality it's much more complex. For example, if they knew that there was I don't know a weapon cache, and it was either in this building or that building right next to it, then they would bomb both of the buildings. And for example, the whole notion of what exactly is a weapon cache, then you know you imagine 100 I don't know grad rockets, when in reality they don't know if it's 100 grad rockets or or you know a, one a Kalachnikov in a closet, which obviously is a completely different. Uh, a question when you're trying to to weigh the legitimacy of the of the strike. Not to mention that many of the intelligence uh, was collected, let's say, two years ago or three years ago, and you don't know if it's still relevant. Now, the last point that I want to make about this is about the execution itself. Yeah, because here that they, like I said, they claim it's all very accurate and and precise, but. In reality, they do very little and have very limited ability to what they say is cleaning the targets. Yeah, they don't really bother making sure that people le left the houses that they were about to target. And the last point in regards to that is the whole issue of, you know, this very American term of collateral damage. Yeah, that how many civilians you're willing to kill in order to achieve your military target. While we were already shocked in previous operations that they are willing, let's say, to kill 10 civilians in order to kill one Hamas uh, a member, in this war, it's already 100 people and more. And I think all of those things combined show this big gap between, I guess, at least what supporters of Israel think about the way that the IDF is fighting and the way it is actually fighting and, and why it is so deadly and uh, disastrous. That's it.